Hello, welcome to another cooking edition of Melkir Talks. Today, we're not doing food, we're going to do some drink. Yes, it's been quite some time since I've done any form of drink. Uh, if you're familiar with my channel, you might have noticed the hour-long video on tea. I like tea a little bit, um, <laughs> but there's some good knowledge in there. If you haven't checked it out, I'll remake it one day in little snippets to make it a bit easier to check. But it's a great video, so i make some more drinks. Today, we're going to make plum punch. Now, plum punch is mentioned in Lord of Chaos Chapter 46. Um, and if you don't want spoilers, why don't you skip ahead about 10, 15 seconds until you see a jewel screen with all the ingredients. Uh, and that is where Perrin meets his, uh, his in-laws, basically. And we get a, a little bit of uh, is he good enough type situation. And this is the drink that he squashes in his uh, chalice pitcher, cup, whatever you want to call it, um, and uh, so it spills everywhere. We're going to make that today. So it's about time we get cooking. So, all right. So what are you going to need to make plum punch? Well, obviously you are going to need some plums. I've already got them here pre-sliced. Um, this is about eight plums or something of that nature, but as many plums as you want to put in. This is a plum punch, so we want to make sure there's plenty in there. I've just sliced them up, mine the stones, cut around those, easy peasy. You're going to need about half a litre of cranberry juice, apple juice, and dry cider for your base. Um, you can add more alcohol at this point. You could add some, some peach brandy, some regular brandy, I don't know, some kind of flavoured gin if you're going a bit crazy. I'm not sure how well that would work. But I've decided to go in and throw in some more cider because I love cider. So that's my, my, my thing there. But uh, plenty of uh, plums to make it strong on that flavour. You're going to need some honey. Although because I've got, I'm adding um, some extra cider that's quite sweet, I'm not going to go quite as much honey as usual. If you were adding some kind of spirit or something, you could go uh, four tablespoons of honey. I'm going to go sort of three just to take it down one edge, one, one edge, one notch. Uh, you're going to need some cloves. Got some cloves here. You'll need some lemon. I've got uh, just over half a lemon here, nicely sliced. You're going to need some cinnamon sticks. Now, I've got cinnamon bark, which uh, let me just hold that up to the camera. There we go. Um, so I've got cinnamon bark, which oh, I found in my local supermarket, and it's just fabulous. So I've gone with cinnamon bark instead, but cinnamon sticks is obviously what most people will find. Use those. A lot of fun. And um, that's pretty much it. It's not an overly complicated dish. So we'll just get straight into it. So first you want to start putting things in your pot. Have your pot ready. We're going to go, as I said, about half a litre of cranberry tip for pouring if you pour it the other way around there we go when you pour it out you don't get any of that crazy glug 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 so we want about about half a liter of that and half a liter of apple juice Want to work there, did it? You need to add your ciders in my case, or your cider in other spirits if you're going for other spirits, and then half a dozen cloves, a few tablespoons of honey, and your bark. You only want about half a dozen cloves, don't go crazy. Very potent. Once you've got that in there, you want to bring this up to the boil. So I've got this on full heat. You can see I've got all my cloves in there. I've got my lemons. I've got the cinnamon bark. Obviously, you're using cinnamon sticks. Uh, and all my liquids and the honey. You want to bring this up to the boil. When you get it to boiling, you want to take it back down until it's just simmering. So let's speed through to that bit. Thank you. 
Okay, so it's just coming up to the boil now. Um, it has taken a little bit longer, but I feel like that's because I added four fridge temperature drinks to the pot. Because <laughs> the apple juice, the cranberry juice, and both types of cider were in the fridge pretty much up until I started the video. So it took a while to heat through, especially in this large pot I'm using. But I knew I'd need the, the large pot because I'm adding extra liquids of a, of a sizable amount. So, but the smells, oh my God. Just off those is amazing. I'm getting a big hit off the clothes. So definitely don't do more than the half dozen I, I showed you. I'm feeling the lemon, the, the cinnamon sitting behind there. And obviously very, very fruity. Now is when you add your plums. Okay, so we add the plums in. Lovely. Make sure we get all of it. Let's give that a stir around. Wonderful. And you turn it down to the low. I'm just going to put the lid on like that. So plenty of steam can get out of the pots, it can boil. Uh, and I just keep an eye on that as we're going. I might turn it up, I might turn it down. Um, I've just added a lot of cold fruit to it, so it's brought the temperature of the dish down for a while. But that is going to take anywhere between 15 minutes and half an hour. So it depends how strong you want the punch flavor, the, the plum flavor to be in there. It depends how many plums you've thrown in there. It depends how big, I mean, if you're doubling this, it's going to take longer to cook through for every stage. Obviously, if you're making a smaller batch, it's going to cook quicker. The guideline in this recipe is 15 minutes. I don't think that's long enough. So I'm going to leave this a good sort of 20, 25 minutes, somewhere in that sort of region. Do a few stirs, taste tests, and uh, see how we get. But while that's brewing, why don't we sit down and have a cup of caffeine? I uh, hope you've got yourself a nice cup of calf or even a cup of tea or something stronger if you feel the need. It's still not a great time of year, but uh, I hope you've got something to enjoy. Mm. Ah. Today, I have a mug from uh, my local cat cafe. So back in the days when you could go and see people in strange places or even just regular places, um, there was a cafe. Well, there still is a cafe, but there's a cafe that has free roaming cats around its premises and you're allowed in uh, in you know certain sizes of groups and for certain periods of time and uh, yeah these were a couple of the cats that live there um i haven't been in quite some time uh, thank you covid but uh, yeah bought myself a little mug there to commemorate my visit because as you know i enjoy mugs and uh, i thought i would use that one today so cheers so what am i talking to you about today in cat chat I thought I would give a little bit of shine to someone else. So I was uh, perusing some of the discords and someone posted something that really caught my attention. And it's about the so-called slog. Now, for those of you familiar with my podcast, you will know that I did an episode with Andrew the Bard back in October, where we both sat there and said, actually, we don't think there's a slog. Um, I know there's some big divide between those that have been reading since the beginning. Uh, on a general basis and those that didn't have to wait for the books to come out. But I know people that have been reading since 1990 when I of the World came out and they experienced the weight on, the, you know, well, there's no quotations there. They experienced the weight on the books, but didn't feel the slog. But I, this was a really interesting perspective on the slog. So I thought I'd read it to you. This is on from Reddit, Jacko the Shadow, um, can, you know, great on you. So um, hear me out. This is a fairly long post. So hear me out as well. Hear me out because I keep seeing a lot of new or interested readers approaching the slog with entirely too much trepidation. I worry that the community is scaring off newer readers, especially those of us that had to wait three years and got rewarded with Frostroads of Twilights. And apparently they, and I'm quoting them, it was not worth waiting for, but it was worth reading. I liked it myself, but you know, that's me. We, we all hate Morden, apparently. <laughs> we all hate the succession, apparently. True, some of the other plot lines stall out for a bit, but it's these two in particular that grab the most hate. Why? I'll focus on Molden as that's my least favorite. I had to ask, what about Molden make me dislike it so much? It's slow. Jordan seemed determined to make to show us every insignificant detail around Perrin. So much talk and so little action. Even when something does happen, the Shan Chen, Perrin disarming a stone dog, the Dark Hound tracks, etc. 
it's surrounded by pointless interactions that don't really move the plot forward. It took me a few reads, but I honestly think it's kind of brilliant. First reason, point of view. Almost all the boring parts are from Perrin's point of view. All these annoying details, that frustration and desire to just get this over with and move on, that feeling that nothing is happening. That is exactly how Perrin feels. Us, the readers, feel his frustration. Perrin feels like he isn't moving fast enough. So do we. Perrin feels frustrated by camp politics and Vera Lane spreading rumors. So do we. A whole chapter on buying grain? Pointless, needless information that perfectly encapsulates Perrin's frustration at even the simplest things becoming a time-consuming ordeal. We all just want to see Perrin stomp some Shido, rescue his Falcon, expose Galena, artfully deal with Masima, and ride off like the hero in some full Gleeman's tale. Instead, we get to really get into character's head. We get to feel what he feels instead of being told what he feels. And I think that's brilliant. That applies, and this applies, I think, to any of these slow or frustrating parts. Elaine, the kid who likes to climb trees, nurse sick animals, and go on adventures, is going to find the details of court boring. Elaine, who was born and raised and trained to rule a whole life, suddenly has a bunch of sea folk wandering around her home like they own the place. Elaine, who is the rightful heir, is aware the last battle of coming, who is the best able to prepare Andor in almost every sense, has to fight a civil war. Has to rally support she should already have. Plus, she's pregnant to boot. Like her only solace is Avienda, and now you don't just feel. And now don't you just feel that Avienda is kind of the highlight in those chapters? But the bath, it sucks. The writing is honestly not engaging, and it doesn't move the plot forward. I can't defend that. It goes on for too long. It's one of the last quiet, peaceful moments Elaine gets to spend with Avienda, and it's not a great moment. It's not really important to the plot, but it's important to Elaine. Did you feel that Matt spent too long in Ebudar? So did Matt. Always feel that Alan Lucas' show slowed everything down? So did anyone who traveled with the show. Did you find Salada Aes Sedai <laughs> frustrating and petty? So did Egwene. Did Nynaeve's block really annoy you? Did you find yourself wanting her to finally break through? Yes, so did Nynaeve. This is way longer than I planned, but I just wanted to share my thoughts. I think the slog is real. It re it's really hard to want to keep reading when it seems like everyone is exactly where they were 1,500 pages ago. It's frustrating, can be a little boring. I don't think the quality of Jordan's writing drops. I don't think Harriet's editing was any different. I think these sections are doing exactly what they, what they intended to do. And that is to ride the POV, to not just see a character's thoughts, doubts, and worries, but to feel, as the reader, what the, chapters are, what the characters are feeling, even when those feelings are impatience, frustration, or anger. I don't think anyone will really enjoy the slog because we aren't meant to enjoy it, but it's brilliant. And then they've edited, say, like, they wanted to clarify some points, so they don't think Jordan's intent was to frustrate the reader. They think the intent was to frustrate the character and for you to experience that viscerally, um, you know, and for the you know, us as a reader to have emotional connections to whatever point of view is going on um, and, and so on and so forth, these few other points. But I just think that's brilliant. What a way to look at the slog, the, all the characters being slowed down and they're feeling all these frustrations and angers and disappointments and you are feeling that too with them. What an immersive experience. I think it's fabulous. I've always enjoyed the slog. I've never thought of it as a slog. Um, I started the series pretty much as the slog started. So by the time I'd caught up reading wise, I was halfway through the slog. So I had a little bit of the slog, but not really as much as those that have been reading since 1990. But again, as I said, I've got friends who've been reading since 1990. And they didn't think there was a slog at all. So swings and roundabouts. But I think if you just give the slog a different approach and look at it like, hey, this is what they're all going through. And this is like Jordan's written it so we can actually feel that with, you know, feel their frustration, empathize with the character. You know, I think it gives you a whole appreciation for it. So that's today's calf chat. Sorry, it was a little bit of just me droning on and reading too, but I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you give the slog another go give it a new appreciation perhaps, maybe just empathize a little bit more with it. Who knows? You don't have to, no obligation, but I just thought I'd put it out there. So let's have check in on the punch and see how that's going. Okay, so it's been going about almost 10 minutes now. I did have it slightly boiling at one point, uh, so I've had to turn it back down. Um, but as you can see there, the, the plums are just starting to 
look at that, just break down, which means they're releasing all their flavor into this punch. And it just, mm, the smells are just growing and growing. The, the flavors there are clearly combining. Let's have a little taste. Woo, you can feel that dry cider there as the base. Lovely. Okay, so it's only, it's not really fully into cooking yet or, or, or marinating, whatever phrase is appropriate here. Um, it loses me at this moment. So I'm going to put the lid back on and I'm going to leave that. Might turn it down just a little bit more because you just want that simmering. You don't want it boiling. So that's about right. Leave that for at least 15 more minutes, I think. I really want those plums to break down into the mix and uh, to just infuse their flavor through all those other ingredients in there. And uh, we will come back and see what it's like. So see you back in 15, 20 minutes. Depends how long it takes me to drink my calf. <laughs> Bye. Well, I've just given it a bit of a taste and it's a tad tart from all the plums. So maybe I should have got sweet plums or I'm just gonna add more honey because that seems the logical thing to do. So, but this is the important thing about tasting because you never know what you're gonna get otherwise. So, let's put some more honey in there. But that has, oh my God, this, it is filling my house with the smell of fruit and cinnamon and the cloves. And then there's a little bit of citrus flowing around in there as well. And it's just like, wow. That is just incredible. So I'm gonna let that go for another few minutes, get that honey mixing in slightly, and then we're gonna serve it up. So very excited. Okay, here is my punch. Oh, that is heavenly. I tell you what, it's been snowing for England, a lot of snow for the rest of the world, probably not much snow, but oh, cold frosty mornings that you've been having and you'd be like Do you know what i want to warm up in the afternoon fuck it warm up in the morning who cares this smells perfect i'm getting all those beautiful flavors the cloves the cinnamon a little hint of citrus at the back and all that sweetness from the plums and the cider and the and the honey and that oh perfect balance that extra honey did it that was just oh, so good. It's still quite hot, so I can't like gulp it back, but mm. oh, that is fabulous. I'm getting just, so I get the sweetness come in first and then just down the side, I get all the tartness from just the, the plums and the cranberry in there. And then it finishes off with just rolling through the flavors that you get, the cinnamon, the, the cloves, all that. And then you finish with the sweetness from the honey and it's just like, oh, that is, that is heaven in a glass right there. And I am thrilled. I'm going to be making this more often. I'll tell you that right now. I'm definitely going to try out some versions with brandy. Um, I think you could probably, what else is quite sweet? You could throw in all sorts. If you have a sweet liqueur, don't, don't do a creamy liqueur, obviously. But yeah, you could throw in any kind of just regular sweet liqueur in there. I think most types of brandy would work well. If you got the right type of gin that wasn't very sharp, but was quite sweet, that would go well in there. You could throw in, oh God, you could throw in some Cointreau. You could throw in Chambord. Uh, probably saying that wrong, sorry. Um, wow. Oh, Perrin, you missed out, man. This is good stuff. Mm. And I've got plums in there. And they just melt as soon as you eat them because they've just been softened and they've infused all that flavor. And that, by God, is amazing. So yeah, ladies and gents, plum punch that uh, Perrin, you've really missed out on, bro. Like, wow. So give it a go yourself. Let me know what you think. Tell me what you think in the comments about the, um, the article that I spoke about for the slog. I will put a link to that Reddit article in the description to the show. So please have a read. Let me know what you think. Um, you know, love any feedback. And of course, please go and check out my other things you do, like daily dad jokes I do on Twitter, Wheel of Time Base. They're always good fun.
If you want to listen to my podcast and hear me theorize wacky theories, serious things, then check that out as well. But most importantly, if you're a fan of the audiobooks, this weekend, yes, this weekend, Friday, 29th of um, January, I have the joy and the pleasure of saying that Michael Kramer and Kate Redding are appearing on my podcast. Can't believe that. My good friends, Zool and Vance, are joining me, and we are talking all things about the audiobooks, but there might be some talk of world domination and um, things like that, just for fun. So please go check it all out. Links are in the description, and uh, I will see you next time. Bye, everyone.